Welcome to all of you in this uh, 40 lecture course on the artificial neural networks and applications. The subject of artificial neural networks has matured to a great extent over the past few years and especially with the advent of very high performance computing, uh, the subject has assumed a tremendous significance and has got a very big application potential in very recent years. Now, this subject of artificial neural networks is going to be covered in approximately 40 lectures and in that uh, um, uh, today uh, I am going to begin with the introduction to the artificial neural networks. So, we will be first defining what a uh, neural network basically means and as the name implies actually the word the term neural networks derives its origin from the human brain or the uh, human nervous system uh, which consists of a massively large parallel interconnection of a large number of neurons and that achieves uh, different tasks, different perceptual tasks, recognition tasks, etc. in an amazingly small amount of time, okay, even as compared to today's very high performance computers. So, this is what we are going to, uh, so this is what inspired uh, uh, the researchers to think that is there any way whereby a computer can be made to mimic the uh, large amount of interconnections and the networking okay, that exists between all the nerve cells. Okay. Can it be utilized to uh, do some complex processing tasks where today's uh, high performance computers also cannot do. So, this uh, subject is the one that we are going to address. So, today we are going to study the introduction to neural networks that is going to be the topic of today. And specifically, we are going to address the introduction to artificial neural networks. Now, whenever I say artificial, okay, the question that immediately comes to our mind is that what is then the natural neural network? Okay. Now, we know that our brain, the human brain is having a highly complex and nonlinear parallel computer. A uh, human brain has a highly complex nonlinear and parallel computer. And this can organize its constituent structural elements. So, its structural constituents of human brain. they are known as neurons and the neurons are interconnected not in a very simple way, but in a rather complex way. So, complex that many of the um, things we do not know yet. Okay. Say if we have got a large number of such neurons or nerve cells okay, which carry out the processing, they will be interconnected typically in a highly complex manner okay, between each other okay. and there will be connections which exist from one neuron to the other and that is how we, uh, that is how a network is realized okay. and this network is as told it is highly complex 
as well as non-linear and is massively parallel okay because our human brain has got uh, typically billions of uh, nerve cells okay with trillions of such interconnections existing okay now let us uh, uh, i mean understand something which uh, um, uh, we can give as an example let's say a uh, familiar task of recognition whenever we meet a person okay a uh, known uh, uh, a person who is known to us we can recognize that what's the name of that person because he must be a friend of ours he must be some known person and we will be able to uh, tell that who he is whenever we meet him and how is it that we are going to do it we are going to perform a task of recognition now we may be knowing thousands of people around okay uh, and uh, i mean what we have to do is to immediately instantly recognize that person that okay i mean he is somebody whom i had met 5 years ago and his name is such and such he works in such and such place or i had met him in connection with these works okay we can immediately uh, uh have this recognition task okay this face recognition now supposing instead of myself doing it i ask a computer to do this task how much of time would you think that a conventional computer is going to take it's not going to be a very easy computation for a computer because firstly that you know that person but a computer doesn't know that person firstly that you have to teach to the computer that okay there are photographs of different people okay supposing if i know uh, i mean 1000 persons okay then i should be feeding the photographs of 1000 people okay into the computer now i meet a person okay so i now capture his photograph okay and then i feed to the computer that okay now you try to match the present photograph with all the thousand photographs that you are going to have in the database now the computer is meticulously do that task okay i mean you you must have trained him okay that how to perform a recognition how to match the given image with that of the stored photographs okay and then ultimately at the end of all the computations and at the end of all the comparisons with 1000 uh, people's photograph which is there in the computer database the computer is going to give us a result saying that okay the person best resembles this photograph okay now this could take i mean quite a long time okay maybe a few hours or who knows i mean maybe Uh, several hours that would all depend upon how many such images are we having in our database if our database is very large okay if we uh, want to track down a person from a collection of let's say 10000 image 100000 images then the task is going to be really complex because then so many so many comparisons are involved but how much of time are we taking we are doing it almost instantly now how are we going to do that very instantly is it that the computational capability that exists in the humans okay is it uh, enormously different from the way a computer is doing well if we try to think in terms of the processing speed okay we will be getting a different type of a result like today's silicon ic's we know okay its response time is expressed in terms of nanoseconds a nanosecond is a time which is 10 to the power minus 9 of seconds whereas if we are looking at the processing speed of a human neuron okay that may be 
five to six orders slower than that of a uh, uh, typical uh, ICs. Okay, and that may take several milliseconds, and milliseconds, as you know, is ten to the power minus three seconds. So it is six order slower, five to six order of slower. But in that case, the the question remains as a very puzzling one. That then, how is it that the neural processing within the human brain, okay, happens to be much faster? than that of today's computer because we are using I mean the elementary block of the digital computation is all those integrated circuits which have got uh, processing times of the order of nanoseconds whereas the elementary block of the uh, human computation the neurons that is 10 to the power minus 3 seconds. So then how is it that this one happens to be much faster than this? The answer lies in the fact that the network of uh, human neurons in the brain, okay, that is a massively parallel. Okay, there is a massively parallel network of neurons. And as I told you that the number is of the order of something like 10 billion typically there will be 10 billion of such nerve cells or neurons and this will consist of approximately 60 trillions of interconnections. So, the answer lies in this massively parallel structure. Okay. So, now the question is that is it possible for anybody to perform the tasks that a human brain does. Is it possible to mimic that using the uh, I mean using the electronic components or is it possible to realize that task using a computer software? Well, it is not that easy because we do not have I mean even in the age of uh, parallel computers, we cannot really think of putting so many processing units and realizing it in a massively parallel scale. Okay. All that we can do within our limitation is that we can interconnect a network of processes no doubt and rather than considering the uh, structure of a human brain in totality. Okay we can only try to mimic okay, a very small part of it, an extremely small part of it okay, in order to do some very specific task. Okay. That is the best thing that we can do using the uh, I mean using electronic components and using the software we can do only to a limited extent. We can make neurons, okay, but that is surely going to be different from the biological neurons that we have talked about so far. Okay. So, what we are going to study is the artificial neural networks. Okay. By artificial, we inherently mean that something which is different from that of the uh, natural or the biological neurons. So, this is the subject artificial neural networks in short form we very often refer to it as ANN. Okay. Now, uh, uh, firstly that let us understand that why at all we are going in for an artificial neural networks. Okay. What are the advantages that it is going to offer to us? Okay. So, let us list out the its usefulness and some capabilities. Number one that it exploits the non-linearity. Now, 
I think all of you should be able to understand the terms linearity and non-linearity. Basically, if there is a system okay, where we give a set of inputs and we expect some output out of it. In that case, we call the system to be linear if the relation between the output and the input can be best described in terms of a simple linear equation. If there are let us say four inputs and one output, then if the output is a linear combination of all the four inputs, then naturally the system is linear. Whereas, if we uh, write, uh, if we can write the output only in terms of not only the linear terms, okay, but also its higher order terms. In that case, the system is no longer linear, the system becomes non-linear. Okay. Now, a uh, lot of times for simplicity, we consider linear computational models, but if we are looking at the real life problems, most of the real life problems they happen to be highly nonlinear in nature. So, for that purpose, we need nonlinear computational units as well, and the neurons are the ones that happen to be nonlinear. So, what we have got here is an interconnection of nonlinear neurons. So, in artificial neural networks, we have got an interconnection of nonlinear neurons. And another thing which should be noted is that the nonlinearity is distributed throughout. In fact, the very nature of computation as you can realize is highly distributed in nature. So, the nonlinearity that we are talking of is naturally distributed. The second usefulness that one must talk about is the input output mapping. You see that you are providing some input to the system and in response, you are going to get some output. Okay. Now, uh, I mean, we uh, can go in for a learning mechanism, a learning where a teacher is involved, in which case what we do is that we feed the inputs and then we also say what the expected output is going to be. So, in other words, we are specifying that for a given input, what is going to be the output or the desired response. Now, it is uh, possible that our uh, computational uh, unit that we are having, that is not able to achieve the, the actual output that we get may be different from that of the desired output. Okay. There may be a difference between what is actual and what is desired. What we can do is that we can accordingly modify, I mean if our system has got a set of free parameters, some parameters that we can adjust. So, if we are having such kind of free parameters, then we should be able to adjust the free parameters of the system. Okay, such that for a given input or a set of inputs, we can obtain the output that is closest to our desired output. Okay. In that case, we may not be able to achieve that immediately. Okay. First time we feed a pattern, okay. our system does not know does not, I mean has not encountered that pattern before, 
we are feeding that okay what the desired response is going to be, but then the actual output will be different. So, the difference that exists between the actual output and the uh, desired output that adjusts the parameter of the system such that the difference between the actual and the desired is minimized and that we may have to do several times. So, there is a process of learning okay? and this learning as you can understand involves a teacher. There is a teacher who says that corresponding to this input, this is what the output should be and if it is not, then the teacher is asking you to correct. The teacher is asking you to adjust the free parameters which are available in the system, so that next time you feed the input, the same input, you can get an output which should be closer to that of the desired. So, this is something which is very important, very, very important okay? and this is what is going to make the neural network okay, remarkably different from the con conventional computational unit and that is in the sense that it has got a learning ability. Okay? And in this case, the input output mapping that we were referring to so long is basically referring to learning with a teacher. Okay. Here, a teacher is definitely monitoring. Now, not that all the time we can find a teacher. Okay. There may be some situations okay, where we may have to learn without a teacher also, maybe from simple associations. You see, let us look at the developmental process of a child. Now, a child is born with a brain and that brain has got I mean a massive interconnection of uh, its neural processing units, but a child has to develop himself or herself okay, with a process of learning. Okay. A child sees so many new things. I mean, uh, when the world is new to a child, the child learns, the child finds out many things by himself or herself okay? and that the child is able to do through some process of association. Let us say that, uh, I mean, a child sees so many animals okay, around. Now, a child sees that a group of four-legged animals is called a cat, a group of four-legged animals is called a dog. Okay. Now, a child may be making mistake initially, I mean sometimes okay, a child could get confused between what a dog is and what a cat is. Okay. So, he may feel little confused, but the parents are there as his or her teacher and the parent corrects that, okay, no, this is not a cat, this is a dog that you are pointing to. So, now the child knows that okay, a dog has got some specific pattern characteristics, a cat has got some specific characteristics. So, when he sees more number of cats and he sees more number of dogs, then it is possible for child to, for the child to distinguish that okay, this category of four-legged animals are cats and this category of four-legged animals are dogs. Okay. Now, a lot of times a child learns by himself, okay. I mean through associations. Okay. He makes mistakes, he explores a lot of things on his own, he makes mistakes, he corrects. So, learning, we have got two types of learning, learning with a teacher and learning without a teacher or a sort of auto association that takes place. Now, the third thing that one has to talk about the characteristics of the neural networks is what is called as adaptivity. Okay? Now, the neural networks, they can adapt their free parameters to changes in the 
surrounding environment. So, this can adapt the free parameters. In fact, I mean some of you may be feeling little confused that what exactly do I mean by the word free parameters. Okay. I will come to that later on actually uh, in respect of the human brain the free parameter basically refers to what is called as the synaptic connection and it, it all is uh, tuned by the strength of the connections, but we will come to that later on. So, at the moment let us accept this word free parameter okay, uh, where the explanation of that would come little later or if it is not clear through this lecture naturally with uh, uh, the next few lectures you will be able to automatically understand this. Okay. Now, this can adapt the free parameters okay, to the changes in the surrounding environment. Mm, well, uh, you see, I mean naturally you can understand one thing that we definitely have to go through the process of learning throughout our life okay, in some sense or the other. Now, the world that was there during our childhood okay, is not the same world that we are seeing today. There are so many changes, okay, so much of developments have taken place uh, in the scientific and technological world our lifestyle changed altogether, okay. our culture when, uh, has gone through changes. Okay. There are changes everywhere okay. and you see that still we are able to um, uh, cope up with this world. Now, how is it so? So, there are so much of changes in the surrounding environment that we are seeing around us, but we can adapt ourselves. Okay. That, is, that is a capability which uh, we the human beings are having okay. and that we are doing by making some internal ad adjustments or the adjustments of the free parameters that we will come to a little later. Uh, another characteristics of the neural networks is that it not only gives us the response. Now, response I was referring to Basically, what I said was that there is some kind of when I was talking of the input to output mapping, okay, there is a definite uh, input that we are feeding and we are expecting some response okay, or the output from it. Now, at the end of learning, okay, it is able to get the correct response, but a neural network can not only report what the response is, but it can also tell that it is re the response with what confidence level. So, in that we can say that the neural network is able to give what is called as evidential response. Okay. And just see that uh, I mean we the human beings okay, lot of times we give the response with some evidentiality in it. Like we can always say that yes, I think it is going to happen that way. We associate the word I think that means to say that uh, we are associating some kind of a confidence measure. Okay. Not that we are 100 percent confident, but maybe when we say I think with a good degree of confidence we can say that yes, the feeling is that it is going to happen. So, that is to say associating a confidence with the decision. So, it is not only a decision, but it is a decision with a confidence measure, with a measure of confidence. So, all this we are telling as the characteristics of the biological neural network systems. Okay. Now, whether all these things could be mimicked into the artificial neural networks or not is something that we have to explore later on. Okay. 
Another very important characteristics which the, uh, the biological neural network system exhibits is that its ability for fault tolerance. Now, what happens if supposing one particular nerve cell is malfunctioning or let us say that one connection okay, from one nerve cell to the other, a single connection is somehow not working. Okay. Is it so that our entire nervous system is going to collapse because of that? No. We can still carry on with our normal activities without any noticeable uh, change. Okay. If too many neurons are affected, maybe that we will have some effect okay, of it, but okay, I mean it is not something that is leading to a catastrophic failure. Whereas, I mean unless you built in some fault tolerance into the computer system, okay, you know that unless that is purposefully built in, then I mean the failure of one processing unit could very often lead to a disaster. The entire uh, computer system can collapse or the entire network can collapse. I mean this sort of catastrophes can happen, whereas with the uh, biological neural networks, okay, if some neuron malfunctions or if some connections are malfunctioning, okay, all that it leads to is some kind of a degradation in the performance, certainly not a catastrophic failure and that degradation is what is called as graceful degradation. So, graceful degradation in the sense that it all depends that how much of fault has taken place. If the fault is too many, then the degree of degradation is large, whereas if the fault is not much, then the degree of degradation is small. So, it is called as the graceful degradation okay. and in that sense, the biological neural network system is highly fault tolerant. Okay. And it is possible to incorporate this fault tolerance mechanism even in the artificial neural networks also. The next point that we must point out, okay, in fact this is uh, the, I mean this is motivated by the fact that there is a massively parallel computation that our brain is doing. Now, if we have to list about the capabilities of an artificial neural networks, okay. then for the artificial neurons, we can list one of its characteristic that the neurons, the artificial neurons that should be VLSI implementable. So, we can tell about its VLSI implementability. Okay. By this, what I mean to say is that using the very large scale integrated circuit, it is possible to integrate a large number of neurons together. Now, naturally we cannot think of integrating 10 billions of neurons. If we could do that, then we could have mimicked the human brain completely, but we cannot do that much. But as I was telling you that if it is utilizing a network of artificial neurons okay, to do some particular task, okay, some particular application, then naturally, I mean, we, 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 we could be able to do that okay, using the VLSI implementation and in fact, it, uh, uh, it is possible that way because the neurons are absolutely parallel computational unit. Now, uh, the neurons which are existing in a system which are forming a network, they are, they can all do independent computation. Okay. I mean it is one is of course dependent upon the others, but there is a large number of parallelism. I mean there is a good degree of parallelism that is involved with it. And in fact, when we see the particular neuron structures okay, in the subsequent lectures, okay, this aspect will be more and more clear to us. Okay. And then uh, coming to the uh, basic motivation of the artificial neurons, okay, uh, 
uh, another point that we should say is its neurobiological analogy. Now, everything as I was telling you was motivated by the biological neural network system. Okay. So, these uh, seven points okay, are basically uh, dealing with the properties of neurons, but all these properties okay, could be imparted to the artificial neurons as well. Okay. They are the properties which the biological neurons fulfill and they are the properties which the artificial neural networks also can be made to fulfill starting from the aspect of nonlinearity, the input output mapping or the learning mechanism, the adaptability. Okay. The adaptability is uh, a thing which we can do, but even a, a, an artificial neuron also can be made adaptive okay, if we train it that way. Then coming to the evidential response, there also we can train a neural network, artificial neural network to do that. The fault tolerance, the VLSI implementation and the and primarily that everything is biologically, neurobiologically motivated. Now, we should uh, uh, I mean before going into the depth of the artificial neural network, okay, we should see the structure of the um, uh, human uh, brain. Okay. Now, rather than drawing a human brain, okay, we will be considering a typical nerve cell okay, which uh, we refer to as a pyramidal cell okay, and that should look something like this. Let us say that okay, now here we draw what is called as a cell body. So, supposing this is the cell body and with that we now connect the following. We connect a, a, a thing which is called as axon okay. and these axons are basically acting like transmission lines, the lines that can carry electrical signals. Okay. And in terms of its electrical characteristics, one can say that it is having a high degree of electrical resistance and offers a large capacitance. Okay. So, this has got high R and high C. Now, these axons, they act as the transmission lines for carrying the electrical signals and they end up with the. So, here you can see that there is some tree like structure okay, and all these ultimately end up in synaptic terminals what is called as synaptic terminals and these are basically used for making connections with the other nerve cells. Okay. Now, this basically is nothing but the output part of the neuron. Okay, I should have shown the input part first, but let us draw that. Now, these are the response zone that is to say with the synaptic connections and that will lead to the other uh, neurons and then we have here this is referring to the receptive zone and we call this as basal dendrite okay which is basically referring to the receptive zones from which we can get the inputs okay so these are the basal dendrite and then we have the apical dendrites In fact, as compared to the uh, axons, the dendrites are having 
more number of branches. Okay. Whereas dendrites are much smaller as compared to axons. Now, typically this lengths, the lengths of axons are much larger than that of the dendrites. So, these are the apical dendrites and this ultimately would be connected to the synaptic inputs. So, these are all going to synaptic inputs, so that it can receive signals from the other neurons. So, you see that this is the complete what is called as the pyramidal cell. So, now the pyramidal cell as shown here, this can receive synaptic inputs from other neurons okay. and the these uh, will basically carry the signal all to the cell body. Okay. So, here the processing part will be done where all these inputs will be combined and how they are going to be combined? They will be combined in accordance with the strengths of these connections. Now, all the connections are not of the same strength. Some connections are very strong and some connections are weak. Now, if the connections happen to be very strong, in that case the signals also, the signal strength also will be large there. Like here, if this connection is strong, then the signal that will be contributed by this input will be much more than if this happens to be a weak synaptic link, in that case the signal coming from here will be weaker, the signal from this may be weaker. So, like that the strength of the synaptic connections will decide that ultimately what signal, what is the net signal that will come to the cell body as the net input. Okay. Now, that will ultimately decide that what the response is going to be and the response will be transmitted through the synaptic terminals to the other neurons. So, it has got a set of inputs, this is also connected to a set of outputs because ultimately this is one pyramidal cell which is considered okay, within a very large massively parallel network of neurons. Okay. Now, as I was referring to the free parameters sometimes back, the free parameter essentially refers to the strengths of this synapses. Now, as I was telling you that every input is associated with some synaptic strengths, its connection strength. Now, supposing okay, initially there is some a priori connection strengths that one can take and then accordingly there will be some response and that response could be different from that of what is desired. So, if the actual response is different from that of the desired, naturally we have to adjust the internal parameters of the nerve cell and what is that internal parameter? It is this strength of the synaptic connection. So, what we do is that we now alter the connection strengths and then we feed the same inputs okay, and find out that what the output is going to be. This time we may be closer to that of the desired, but still we may not be exactly equal to the desired, so that it will go through another round of synaptic in strength modifications. And this could go on iteratively till the actual response is uh, close to that of the desired response. We may not be able to achieve exactly, but may be able to achieve close to that. So, the synaptic strengths are basically dictating that what the signal strength is going to be and these are basically acting as a free parameter to our biological nerve cell processing and equivalently in the artificial neural network, then we should be building up something, some electrical equivalent 
of such synaptic strengths. Okay. In fact, in an equivalent electric model, electrical model, we can represent a neuron like this that a neuron or a nerve cell will be connected to several inputs. Let us say that these are the inputs and it will be again connected to one or more than one outputs and these inputs will be connected to the nerve cell through some strengths of connection and we may be indicating the strengths of the connection okay right on top of this arrow we can write down that what is the strength of this connection let us say the strength of this connection we call as w1 the strength of this connection we call as w2 this as w3 and supposing there are n number of such inputs connected and we call this strength as wn and we are having here the input signal available to be that of x1 here the input signal that is available let us say it is x2 here x3 is available as input and here xn is available as input so here what happens is that the net signal that will be available at this neuron is going to be x1 into w1 plus x2 into w2 plus x3 into w3 plus so on up to xn into wn. There are n number of such neurons that is interconnected. So, this unit will be summing up all these responses, but then this is a linear summation, but ultimately do we want a linear summation? No, we must be wanting some decision out of it that whether yes or no or a decision which is I mean more quantifiable. We do not want this computation alone. So, in order to arrive at a decision, this must be followed up by some nonlinear processing unit. Okay. There must be some nonlinear unit that will follow this summation okay. and effectively the output that will be available at the, uh, at the output of that nonlinear non unit whatever we have is going to be our output of the neuron. Okay. Now, if that output is different from that of what is desired out of it, then what we have to do? We have to simply change the strengths of this connection. We have to change w1, w2, w3 up to wn, so that with this same set of inputs, with the input still remaining at x1, x2 up to xn, we can then obtain an output that is close to the desired response. Okay. So, this is the equivalent model. So, this is the biological model of a nerve cell okay, with its inputs and outputs and this is the equivalent electrical model. In fact, we will be considering such equivalent electrical models of artificial neurons okay, in our course. Now, we give you an idea about what we are going to study in this course. So, our lecture series will be divided into uh, some uh, specific modules. So, as the course content, we can say that we will first begin with the models of artificial neurons. Okay. That is what we are going to cover from the next day, models of artificial neurons. And then we are going to consider the learning mechanism, the different mechanisms of learning, the supervised learning, the unsupervised learnings, okay, the different conditions for learning, the auto associations and all these things we will be seeing in this chapter. And then we will come to what is called as the single layer perceptrons. In the single layer perceptron, what we will be doing is that 
we will be considering a uh, network of neurons where we will be having uh, the neurons organized as just a single layer. So, we will be having the inputs, then we will be having uh, a layer of neurons and then we will be having uh, the outputs and the layer that is available is a single layer. Whereas, this idea is later on extended to achieve what is called as the multi layer perceptron, where other than the input and the output, okay, we are going to have some intermediate layers of processing. Okay. So, that is the realization of multi layer perceptron, which we will see. In fact, we will be seeing that the single layer perceptron models have got a lot of limitations and those limitations are can be overcome using the multi layer perceptrons. Then after studying the multi layer perceptrons where I mean one can use the multi layer perceptrons to solve uh, what is known as the problems which are not linearly separable, they can be solved using multi layer perceptron and they can also be solved using what is called as the radial basis function networks. That also we are going to cover in this uh, lecture series. And then we are going to uh, study what is known as the principal component analysis, okay, which is based on the eigenvalue decomposition technique and we will see that how a neural network can be very effectively utilized to perform the eigenvalue decomposition and to project a uh, given data into the eigenspace okay, for the purpose of uh, dimensionality reduction. And then we will come to a class of uh, 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 unsupervised or self organizing networks okay, which is called as the self organizing map. So, this will be under the scope of our study in the lecture series. So, uh, that is all for uh, today and from the next class we will begin with the artificial neuron model. Thank you very much.